I do want to note that this session is being recorded. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Don Bentley, the Assistant Superintendent for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Acton Boxborough Regional School District. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, tonight's session will have two distinct parts. First, our panelists are going to spend some time sharing some tips and tricks with you about how to talk to your children about race. And then we'll enter into a Q&A where we'll answer the questions that folks submitted in advance, as well as some of the ones that you enter into the Q&A feature in Zoom. We will need to end promptly at 7.30 as we do have a second session for tweens and teens right after this one. Um, so for those of you who have chosen to spend time with us learning online about how to have conversations with race, about race with your children, welcome and thank you. I recognize that we're all entering this space tonight at different places, but regardless of where any of us are in our journey to anti-racism, we have to accept our vulnerability in this work and act anyway. In recent days, we have watched protests that centered on demands for the same advantages that white people have. In our country, protesting and resisting is foundational to our equity, and it is a response to a suppression of that equity. Some might say, this work is more important now than ever, but to be clear, this work has always been important. Perhaps it's just that more people are now seeing the need for it and committing to being allies for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. As a white woman, I know that I can't completely understand the experience of a person of color. I'm privileged to have learned about racism through books and coursework, not my own personal experience. As such, I believe that a big part of my job is to understand the experiences of our Black families and students in our district and to support and amplify their voices. And as a school leader, I know I can't be neutral in anti-racist work. For white educators and leaders like me, we must engage in deep thinking about this because long-term systemic inequities and injustices can't be solved with short-term solutions. We can't expect our black and brown families to tell us what to do. And we don't have time to sit back and wait until we're all ready. We have to be reflective and engage in this work simultaneously, regardless of how uncertain that might feel. So I wanna welcome our panelists tonight. We have two in person and one virtual. And so I wanna turn it over to Danica and Ed to introduce themselves to you tonight briefly. Hi everyone, my name is Danica Mansell Brown. I am the Associate Education Director of the Anti-Defamation League New England. I have a white Jewish mother and a black American father. My parents met organizing a labor union. So in many ways, um, conversations about justice anchored my household and certainly anchored my parents' relationship in a lot of ways. So most of my professional background is in arts education. After college, I was a professional dancer and also worked as a teaching artist. So most of my work was with young people using performative arts as a platform for social justice and activism. I now work more squarely within the anti-bias space in my role with the ADL, but it's important to me that we find imaginative ways to have conversations about race. So I am very happy to be here with you all tonight, and I hope that in our limited time together, we begin to build our very important toolkits for securing justice and doing anti-racism work. Great. Head over to you. Wonderful. Good evening, good evening, good evening, and thank you so much for welcoming me. My name is Edward Walker. Um, I'm super excited to be able to join in this dialogue <clears throat> in this capacity because this topic, uh, talking to our kids about race, is near and dear to my heart for many different reasons, which I'll explain in, in, in just a second. But first, I think it's important that I let you know what I bring to the conversation. <clears throat> I've been an educator for all of my professional career, uh, which is approximately 20 years. I started in higher education where I led the initiatives for multicultural recruitment for two separate, selective, predominantly white liberal arts colleges. Um, and in one case, I was the only black man in the office. And in the other case, I was one of two black men until my colleague decided to leave. So while I was in higher education, race was always at the forefront for me. One, because it was a part of my job. And, and two, it was really the inevitable. Uh, and so after several years of recruiting in, in higher ed, you know, I'm reaching out to hundreds, maybe even thousands of students, encouraging them to come to one institution. I realized that I might be a bigger service if I transitioned to the secondary side of the desk, where I could help hundreds and even thousands of young people find their way in the world. And so I joined the secondary side of the desk and I found myself in one of the most racially diverse and resource rich communities in the state of Massachusetts. Yet they were just as ignorant about the topic of, of race as many other cities. 
And so it wasn't long before I became an instructor uh, and a teacher coach for an organization known as IDEAS, which stands for Initiatives for Developing Equity and Achievement for Students. Uh, there we conduct graduate level courses, workshops, and seminars. We host conferences for uh, professionals, middle schools, high schools on various topics and often with an emphasis on race. I tend to focus on anti-racist practices in schools. So that said, uh, my why for being here tonight is layered and so I'll break it down into two quick points. First, I'm a black man in America. Uh, and to be a black man in America is to always be conscious of who you are, where you are, what you're doing and what you're saying. And so race is always at the forefront for me. Uh, but above all things, I am a husband to a biracial woman and I'm a father to three daughters and a son who look like me. And so I have always been obligated to have these conversations. And so I'm excited to be here tonight and hope I can share some of my understandings with you. Thank you both. We've had the pleasure in our district to have Danica and Ed as, um, as facilitators of professional learning for our educators um, for the last year, at least, I think maybe two years. Um, and I know that our educators are grateful for both of them. So. The other person I'll introduce to you is Dr. Liza Toulousen, who was booked tonight and couldn't join us, but she sent along a video that I'll show in just a moment. She's an educator, speaker, leader, writer, and a life and leadership coach and a parent. She has 22 years of experience in pre-K to 20 ed education, and she's an engaging facilitator in conversations about diversity, racism, bias, privilege, and power. <clears throat> Through her direct work with students, teachers, and leaders, she empowers individuals to create a more inclusive organization, environment, community, and team. Her cumulative research in interests include the experiences of underrepresented populations, Asian and American and Pacific Islander students, socialization to graduate programs, navigating parenthood, interracial relationships, and others. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology and Child Development, from Connecticut College, a Master of Arts in Higher Education Administration from NYU, and a PhD in Higher Education from UMass Boston. So again, she has joined us via video. So I'm going to share my screen with you here and she's gonna introduce herself a little bit. Sean, we have no sound. Thank you. So we did this earlier and. I think you just have to remember to click on that little button that says share sounds. Exactly. Thank you. So I am going to share my screen and share computer sound because I have headphones in. Thank you, thank you. And we'll try this again. And it's going to be one of those evenings. Technology is wonderful when it works and challenging when it is not. And I had this all booted up and ready to go and was so proud of myself. All right, there is a password. All right. Thank you for holding.
Hey everyone, Liza Toulousen here. Nice to join you. I wanted to just take a couple of minutes to really get us started, frame out what is the conversation that tends to be happening right now in our homes as we process the ongoing violence and injustice and racism that we're seeing happen across the country and also during the time of COVID, a global pandemic. I'm hearing a lot of people say, you know what, Liza, I'm watching the news and I'm not really sure what to make of it all. We're seeing news reports about violence and injustice and protest, but I'm also still watching the news about stay at home orders and safety and physical distancing. Certainly during this time, people are really feeling activated, agitated, feeling like they wanna do something. And I've heard lots of people say, hey, Liza, I know I have to do something. I'm just not sure what that is. Folks, we're also hearing of people who are very tired, frustrated, angry, really processing some strong feelings. Others don't understand why this is happening at all. We just came off of a few weeks of feeling like we were one country, one country working up against COVID and the coronavirus. And then pretty quickly, we started to see aspects of divide and divisiveness happen in our country. Those were ongoing, they just got turned up though. And then people feeling like they don't have the right answers. A lot of our parents and adults and caregivers wanting to have certain types of conversations with their young people, but just don't know if they have the right things to say or the right tools. During this time, we're also hearing people express some of their concerns. So in addition to worries about work, uh, people are also worried about their family and their friends, things that are happening outside of the workspace. For many grown-ups, adults, caregivers, some of their jobs are focused on taking care of other people. And so what does it mean to be worrying about yourself and to take care of yourself during this really difficult time? You'll hear a lot of people say, oh my gosh, I just don't have the emotional bandwidth for this. I'm so tired. I don't have anything left in me. Well, what's that thing that you want to say? What's that statement or that voice or that quote that keeps going around? then your head. If you're with somebody with you, go ahead and turn and talk really quickly. What is it? What is that statement that you keep saying over and over again? So I'm going to talk to you both adults and young people about why this is so important that you're here today, why it's so important that we're talking about this as a family or as a unit. So for the adults, <laughs> you know your child best. There's lots of experts here or educators, child development specialists, and sure, we know a lot, but in the end, you know your child better than any of us. You know how to have difficult conversations, you know what sets them off, you know what calms them down, and you are the most important person to have this conversation with them. We also know that if you're feeling upset about what's going on in the news and around the world, even if your child doesn't view those things, they know that they're seeing you react. And we know that for some of our youngest ones, especially I would say the teenagers too, that when they see that you're upset, one of the inclinations is to say, maybe it's something I've done. Oh, my mom looks really angry. Maybe she's angry at me. And so let's be really clear with them about what we're upset about and what our feelings are so they don't internalize that it could be something that they, they did. And so that's actually something that we're seeing on the news or that's happening in our world. It's important that children know your beliefs and your views and your opinions. It's also a really helpful way for them to develop really critical skills, critical skills around conversation, dialogue, discussion, discourse. You're really modeling during this time how to have some tough conversations. We also know that in different homes and different racial groups and different racialized experiences, that these talks, these sit down serious talks happen in black and brown homes in particular about how to keep our children safe. And we're asking white families to have a similar type of talk. What does it mean to be white? What are the ways in which our whiteness shows up? What does it mean to help be, keep others safe in this world? And what does it mean for us to be safe? What does that look like in a community? We also know that children are watching us. And if we're silent on issues, well, they're going to be silent on them too. Or they certainly won't develop the skills from us about how to have tough conversations. Finally, it's our job to take care of our kids. It's a job to provide them with skills for how to have these tough conversations, to prepare them for the bigger world around them. 
and to prepare them for a life with us and maybe without us. So what can we do to prepare them to be prepared? What can we do to prepare them to have these conversations in the world? Okay, let's turn to young people. Why is this important that you're in this conversation? Well, truth be told, you've always noticed race. Maybe you didn't have the skills or the vocabulary to talk about it, but you've always noticed it. Maybe at some point an adult even shushed you or said, don't say that word. And so we want to acknowledge that the times are a little bit different. We actually want to encourage you to talk about race. So you've always noticed it. It's time for us to give you some tools to have those conversations. You are definitely having a different experience than we did. For some of your parents, when they were growing up to make a phone call, they used a thing called a rotary phone. <laughs> it's how we called people. The phones were stuck to the wall. You're growing up in a really different time, even when you just look at your phones. And so you're growing up in a different time around race, around information, around news, and around leadership. So you have a lot to teach us. There's a lot of things that we can talk about that are so different. You've also likely had more conversations about race. We've really shifted in our schools to say, we're not gonna be colorblind, we're not gonna shy away from it, and we're gonna have some conversations about what race means. For many of us, not all of us, but for many of us grownups, that's actually not how we grew up. And so you have a lot to teach us and have conversations with us about what you're learning. You also likely have a more racially diverse group of friends. So maybe they're not the friends from your neighborhood, but because of social media and because of safe use of social media, you probably have a bigger network of people than we ever had. You're probably learning from videos on YouTube or Khan Academy or other places that you're interacting with folks. So you're having more interactions with different types of people than we might have had when we only just talked to folks in our neighborhood or in our town or in our school. And then finally, we are living in times that are pretty confusing. And here we are during physical and social distancing, you're probably spending a lot of time with people in your house. Well, it is a really good time to have some of these tough conversations to start opening up the lines of communication. So there you have it, folks. Thanks so much for being here, for our panelists, and for taking these courageous first steps to have some difficult conversations as a family. All right, so that was Dr. Toulousen, and who we hope to be able to do some work with later on this year, offering some pieces of advice. Danica and Ed, I'll turn it over to you to sort of make any comments or um, anything about that particular piece. And, you know, my thinking was, wow, you know, that whole right-hand side actually for kids provided me with some really nice sort of ways to start, even start the conversation um, with kids about, you know, things you've noticed and how do I, how do you come to me and those sorts of things. But what kind of tips do you have for us tonight as well? I'll turn it over to Danica. Awesome. I mean, one of the things I think that's important to underscore in the video we just saw is this reality that uh, kids hear as much from what we don't say as they do from what we do say. So um, don't think that just because you are not having conversations with your young person about race that those conversations are not happening somewhere else and that they're not learning and absorbing messages that are racialized without you. Um, I'll pivot a little bit into some of the tips that I have prepared for you all this evening. And I'm going to start by sharing a few personal stories so that we can orient ourselves in the discussion in a way that really adds to the foundation that we're going to be building throughout this call. So as a person of color, I really can't remember a time when race was not a part of conversations I was having at home. Having a white mother and a black father, it became clear to me from a really young age that people had different expectations of and ideas about each of my parents. One example of that being people assuming I was not my father's child. More than once when I was a young child, people assumed that he had kidnapped me. Not just that his daughter's skin didn't match his own or even that he was caretaking a child that he knew, but automatically that he had done something wrong, even as I held onto his arm. And I don't match my mother's skin tone either, but there was never a time when people, you know, automatically assumed that I was not her child. She never had that experience with me and no one ever proceeded to question her even if people didn't automatically make that connection that she was my mom. 
And then in other cases, when I was not with either parent, because I outwardly present to many as being racially ambiguous, um, after people, both kids and adults around me learned that I was black, I got feedback and questions that sent very clear messages that blackness was less desirable, right? Kids telling me that their parents said they couldn't play with me because my dad was black. Teachers asking if I was sure I wanted to draw my father with such dark skin or I prefer a lighter marker. And this type of messaging has never been uncommon for children of color. If anyone is interested in watching how this plays out for other really young children, I encourage you to explore the doll study um, in which social scientists presented a white baby doll and a black baby doll to kids of different races and asked questions like, which one of these babies is pretty? Which is bad? Which is good? Which is smart? And children who were white and black overwhelmingly identified the black dolls as being ugly, bad, misbehaving, unintelligent. So I'm starting with this point simply because it's important for us to recognize that conversations about race will not be neutral, right? If we think about the history of why and how racial classifications were created, we can understand that in any conversation about race, a conversation about racism is not too far away, right? Race is not a biological reality. It's not based based in science, racial categories were created before the discovery of DNA and were created specifically to enforce a social hierarchy where blackness was at the bottom and whiteness was considered superior to all other races. So I'll, I'll pause my little history lesson there and remind us that although race is not grounded in science, it has very real implications for how people move through the world. The the second thing I want to say before handing you some tips you can use immediately to engage with your young people about race and to hopefully pursue your own journey of learning is that you have permission to come back to a conversation if and when you mess up, right? If you are doing learning alongside your child, then it's very likely that some things will come out in ways that feel or sound wrong to you or perhaps were unclear. I'm here to tell you that that's okay. The process of creating safety in our world for everyone includes unlearning many things we were taught and integrating a bunch of new information into our lives. So that means that the process is going to be imperfect. It's going to be messy. It's going to be scary and uncomfortable, but effective action against racism comes from a commitment to learn and be responsible for our actions. So with that said, most of what I will talk about right now will be geared towards white caregivers rearing white children. Families of color, like we heard before on the video, often have these conversations out of necessity so that young people of color can be safe and equipped to navigate racism in real time. This is not necessarily a given practice in white homes. So if you are brand new to this kind of dialogue, welcome, and we are really happy to have you. So, First, it's important for me to acknowledge that developmentally, preschool children are at a much different place than older elementary school children. However, if your family is just starting these conversations, then no matter the age of your young people, keep in mind that any of the following tips I provide can be adapted to meet your kid where they're at. So my first tip is that Preschoolers in reality provide us with a lot of opportunities to talk about race. They are quite observational. They like putting people into categories. They oftentimes decide what they like based on what they see. So if you have preschool age children, you might have already heard them notice skin color. But oftentimes, they don't understand why adults refer to people with peach or light skin as white and people with varying shades of brown skin as black. In our country, race is not simply about skin color. It's also about history and culture and a relationship. So one thing that's important for us to do with young white children specifically, once a white child says, for example, my skin is peach, we should follow up by making an observation about our own skin as well. So if you're a white caregiver, you might say, my skin is light tan. And in our culture, we both have skin we call white. Your kid might not fully understand what culture means, but introducing accurate racial labels and language will prepare your child to be less afraid to engage in conversations about race. This is also important because if you as a white parent or caregiver don't talk about your own race, the message that's communicated is that being white is the default race or that it's just normal, right? Whereas being a person of color is different, it's other, so the other thing we don't want is for white people, children and adults 
to think that black is a dirty word. If they never hear you say it and only hear black in negative contexts, it will be really hard to help your child see all the proud, joyful, wonderful aspects of black life and culture. So using books and toys and even engaging when you're in the supermarket and your kid says, why is that woman's skin brown? Allows us to give accurate, useful, simple information. So start using racial labels really early. Second point, point out unfairness and racism for young children. Our five-year-old might not be ready to handle complex information about racism, but they do have a strong sense of fairness. So we can help our young person along by having what I call noticing conversations. For example, I was once reading a magazine with my young cousin who was white, and I said, all of the children in this magazine are white. His response was, they have the same kind of skin as me. And I responded by saying, I wish the magazine had kids with lots of different skin colors, right? Because not everyone is white. His immediate response was, it's not fair to leave anyone out. Movies, shows, books, and advertising provide us these opportunities to talk about what we notice with our young people, even our really young people, and start to prepare them to be critical about who is included and who is not. This can also include things like a trip to the pharmacy, right? Walk down the Band-Aid aisle. Band-Aids are only available in one shade for the most part. Um, we know there are brands who have made more inclusive shades, but this is not what you see normally in your CVS. So ask your young person, what do you think about that? What, how would you feel if there wasn't a Band-Aid that could match your skin color? Another piece of this should be to include people who are doing things to challenge these realities and make things fairer. One great example of this is Marley Diaz, a black girl who at the age of 11 started the 1000 Black Girl Books campaign because she was not seeing black girl characters in the books she was reading. So she started a donation drive and ended up distributing 1000 books with black girl characters throughout her community. So noticing what's unfair and talking about the people who make things fair prepares younger children to have more complex conversations about racism when they're older. So start pointing out that unfairness early. Next, as you're facilitating this kind of learning with your young person, you're going to have to do some learning yourself. So I ground so much of my work in history because it's a great tool for helping us understand that racism is not something that's accidental. So we can, you know, we can point to laws, practices, policies that have kept people of color away from resources, opportunities, and safeties throughout time. But it's obviously really challenging to give your preschooler an in-depth history lesson. Remember that preschool age children have a harder time distinguishing between past and present. So capitalize on all of those opportunities to bring things up when they happen in real time. Um, with that said, remember that sometimes young, young kids get scared, right? At the reality that not everyone is treated equally. They wonder if something bad will happen to them. Uh, sometimes white children who start observing that they're afforded some societal safety that, that kids of color are not will say things like, I'm happy I'm white. Or an example I heard from a friend when she was reading the book, Mama's Nightingale. Um, it's about a Haitian child whose mother is in an immigration detention center. As they were reading this book, he said, we have the right papers, don't we, mommy? And she reassured him. And then her follow-up was to tell him that she thought every family deserved to live together and feel safe, right? She said something to the effect of, I'm glad we have the right papers, but I'm sad many other people don't. So it's important that we speak up with people who don't have the right papers because every kid wants and needs to be with their family, right? So reminding young people that they have agency and that they can contribute to making the world safer for everyone is a great way to address some of those fears or anxiety your young person might be feeling. Um, for children of color who are feeling fear in a different kind of way, particularly in this moment around how safe they are, it's important to remind them that so many people are fighting for their safety and we're working together to make sure they are safe now and always. Um, for kids who are a little bit older, in the elementary years, the conversations can get a little more complex, right? By this age, we can help children look at the larger impact of racism on a societal level and bring in some of those history lessons. 
So this leads me to my first suggestion for slightly older elementary kids. We have to tell them that history is really complicated. I remember learning about Christopher Columbus in school, but I didn't learn that he and other colonizers killed and displaced thousands of indigenous people. I learned about slavery and I learned about George Washington, but no one told me in school that George Washington enslaved black people. So telling the truth about historical figures lays an important foundation for children. They understand how widespread racism has been throughout history and how persistent it is today so that they can understand why it will take more than just personal change to dismantle racism. It also shows young people that rooting out racism is not simple. And it reminds them and us that the work against racism, both within ourselves and in society, must be ongoing. So as you bring up history, it's important that you do a couple of things emphasize the fact that people of color have always resisted and fought against racism, and make sure that you talk about white allies who have taken risks and used their white privilege to work with people of color. In doing that, we remind kids that this isn't a matter of good and bad people. We remind them that we each have a responsibility to one another to make the world more just and equitable. And then within that history, I encourage you to help young people understand that history isn't necessarily that long ago, right? My grandfather could not vote legally in this country until he was in his 30s. Throughout high school, for my father, he was called the N-word daily. Um, we're watching some of that history play out before our eyes, right? If Martin Luther J uh, King Jr. were alive today, he would be the same age as Barbara Walters. So it's important that we remind young people that history is relative and because the US is fairly new, we're talking about a history that unfolded on top of people who are still living. So use history and learn alongside your kids. My final tip um, is to remember to include contributions of joy, love, and beauty of people of color, right? Our society tells a lot of stories that are quite incomplete, and we need to make sure we provide full narratives about who people of color are. For example, when talking about Black people, our history books often begin with slavery, right? We erase thousands of years of ancient African civilizations, along with contemporary inventions, art, science, literature, contributed by people of color in this country. So we need to make sure that we are not talking about the accomplishments of Latinx, indigenous, Asian people only during designated months. And additionally, we need to make sure that we're having these conversations about race and racism, not only when prompted by tragedies. So find resources that will fill in those gaps and highlight various cultures continuously. Thanks all. I see your lips moving down, but you're muted. We're supposed to put like $5 in a jar, I think every time we, we start talking when the, the mute is on, it's like a, a Zoom bad thing to do. Um, Danica, thank you so much. That was a lot of information in a short amount of time, but between um, thinking about history and just thinking about younger children and all the noticings that they do um, from their innocence and their lenses is so important for us to really think about those. Um, and the whole notion of unlearning and integrating is absolutely critical. So thank you for that. Ed, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. First of all, I want to send a virtual hand clap to Sister Danica. That, that was a phenomenal job. I appreciated the information and I, I resent myself for not taking more notes. Thank you uh, for that information. And first, I want to uh, react to the video from Dr. Toulouse. Um, I think she was hitting the nail on the head regarding some of the internal and external conversations that many of us have or have had with ourselves. I also think she's on point with the examples for why we need to be having these conversations with our families. I, I do want to draw some attention to one comment that she made, and, and she said that uh, you know your children best. I agree with that wholeheartedly because biologically we're in the best positions to speak to our children. And I want to acknowledge that if we don't arm ourselves with knowledge and the skills to facilitate some of these conversations, we can do more harm than good. And so with that being said, I want to offer uh, or at least make an attempt to offer maybe three practical tidbits to help navigate these sometimes chaotic waters. Um, the first thing I want to say is we cannot talk about race as if it's a dirty secret. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Uh, perhaps you have seen this before, perhaps you're even guilty of this, but have you ever noticed that uh, when someone is having a conversation and, and that conversation has led them to mention the word race or even identify someone by their race, 
all of a sudden they go from speaking loudly and confidently to whispering and looking around to see who's listening and who's watching what they're doing. I'm going to show you one thing that if your children are nearby, they are listening and they are watching. And so if they witness you talk about race in a way as if it's a dirty secret, they will ultimately grow up and potentially speak about race in the same way. Why? Because we have normalized it to avoid it, right? To, to, to sneak around the conversation rather than speaking confidently about the conversation with race, especially with our children. It's sort of like when we accidentally use profanity in front of our children. We don't have to give them a definition for the term that we use because our body language tells them that it is a bad word. And so as they eavesdrop on our conversations about race, not only are they reading our body language, but they also emulate our actions. And so again, if we don't arm ourselves with the knowledge and the, the, the skill to facilitate some of these conversations, unintentionally, we may be harming our very own children, right? This is a, uh, without doubt, a, a, a conversation that has been deemed difficult time and time again, because it is one, right? In order to engage successfully, it often requires boldness. And I contend that if you truly want to be bold in these conversations about race with your children, you have to do two things. You have to know the truth and you have to tell the truth. Now that's hard for some folks, without a doubt. Some white folks may want to avoid the truth because it stirs up guilt, shame, fragility. I have known some black and brown people to avoid the conversation because it stirs up anger and pain. Some might just want to distance themselves from the harsh history of slavery, while others believe uh, to be successful in this country, all you have to do is pull yourself up from your bootstraps, but we all know that that is actually not truthful. So talking about race and racism can help our families, and namely our children, understand a lot of critical things in this country, like mass incarceration. It can help us understand why the inner cities overflow with black and brown bodies, while the suburbs are quite the opposite. If every single time you take your child to the park and they don't see anyone that doesn't look like them or if they don't see a person of another race, how do you explain that to them without knowing the truth about redlining? Talking about race and racism can help us understand why there are so few businesses owned by non-white people, even in non-white communities, or why there are such disparities in our educational systems depending on where you live. How can we explain this to our children if we don't know the history of systemic racism within our educational policies? In order to speak the truth, you have to first know the truth. And for the record, you don't have to be a historian to engage in conversations about race because right, these conversations need to happen while we are educating ourselves. So yes, you have to educate yourself, but you can't prolong this conversation while you're reading a book or going to the seminar. And so I'm going to I'll tell you about one trick that I use to help me in conversations, even when I may lack a little bit of knowledge. And what I do is I personalize the conversations and I use scenarios. In other words, I put the child in the story or I put myself in the story or their friends or their family members in the conversation and I use um, friendly scenarios. Our children tend to think more realistically and less abstractly when we when we make them envision their best friend in the story or their favorite uncle in the scenario or their parent in the scenario. I like to call it the what if theory, right? I often will ask questions, what if? What if there was a law or a rule that wouldn't allow me to marry your mother because she is different than me? How would that make you feel? What, what if you couldn't play with your neighbor Tabitha because her skin complexion is different than yours? What, what might that mean to you? Tell me how that makes you feel. But as I engage in the conversations with students, I found that when they can envision themselves as a part of the scenario or part of the story, then they can think a little more critically about it. And I've seen this um, across all ages. Of course, you want to um, modify the story so that it is age appropriate, but the practice doesn't necessarily have to change. And so I encourage you to think about ways in which you can personalize the story and, and make them think about their close friend or make them think about their favorite uncle or their favorite aunt. In fact, make them think about you and, and ask them, what if? That helps them to arrive at understanding uh, a little quicker in some cases. Uh, but I also want to encourage folks, this is the third tip, um, to spend double the amount of time listening versus speaking. There's an old saying, at least in my family, God gave you two ears and one mouth so you can listen twice as much as you talk. Um, now, if we aren't careful, our anxiety or our heightened conscience can make us dump information onto our kids. 
right? The result can become avoidant because no child is going to want to engage with every single time you come to him or her. Uh, you're just dumping information. Every time you read a book, now you want to go and summarize all the chapters with your child. That is not going to be effective. It, it will, in most cases, it will make that child avoid you and avoid the conversation altogether. And so I say that to simply say there is no need to try to dominate the conversations with our children if we can, if we can help that. Uh, my practice has been to insert a thought, uh, give my children ample space to reflect, ask a simple question. Insert a thought, give my children ample space to reflect, ask a simple question. If I repeat that cycle over and over, and I have found that there have been substantial gains in my conversations with my children, and there have been substantial um, uh, gains in understanding, right? So there's a difference, right? There's understanding, there's gaining understanding, but then there's also just having the conversations. And it will go through its growth spurts, right? This is a developmental thing. And so don't expect that the minute you have these conversations, they're always going to get it, right? Think about it. They've been living for eight years, and for the first eight years of their lives, they've never had to give this any attention. You can't or we can't expect that because they're nine years old and we're now ready to have the conversation, that they're ready to have the conversation. So put their well-being at the forefront when you think about having these conversations with your children. So I repeat, insert a thought, give ample space for them to reflect, ask a simple question, then insert another thought, give them the space to reflect, ask another simple question. Listen, I've learned that there is so much to be learned or so much to learn just from listening to our children. Um, and I think it's important for us to give them the space to just talk. Uh, for instance, one day my, my wife and I were sitting at the dinner table and our, at the time she was six years old, our six-year-old daughter joined us at the table. And so we started having the, the usual conversation, how was your day in school and what did you learn? And uh, so my, my daughter actually said, today we talked about segregation. I said, what? She said, segregation. I said, baby, do you mean segregation? She said, yes, we talked about segregation. And so I noticed something. When she said segregation, she immediately grew sad. And so I said, tell me more about what you learned today or what you heard today. And she said, well, daddy, segregation means black people and white people couldn't be together. And I said, what do you mean by that, baby girl? And she said, well, daddy, me and you could have drank from the, uh, me and you couldn't drink from the same water faucet as white people. And then my, bi my biracial wife interjected and she said, but what about me, baby? And my daughter instantly said, no, 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 mommy. You, you can drink from the, you can drink from the same faucet with white people. And in that moment, we realized just how much she had been paying attention to race and difference. And so we knew that it was time, the appropriate time to start engaging her in these conversations. And so instantly I began to read age appropriate books and analyze them with her. I began to watch age appropriate movies and analyze them with her. And again, recreating the scenario by putting my child in the movie or in the storyline or thinking about ways in which I can incorporate her friends in the movie or in the storyline. And then I would approach her with the, what if there? Oh, what if that was you and your friend, Danica? What, what, how would you handle that situation if that was you and your friend, Timothy, right? And so it makes them think, again, realistically about, oh my goodness, if I ever had to be in that situation, what would I do? What I've learned with my youngest children is that they, they begin to ask the appropriate question. Daddy, you, you're my daddy. What would, you, what would you tell me to do in that situation? Voila, now we can have an open conversation about race. So essentially what I am encouraging us to do is ask questions and listen while we continue to educate ourselves about the untold truths and the distorted realities in this country about race and racism. I believe that the worst thing we can do or the most harmful thing we can do is spend years ignoring the conversation because um, I, I think Sister Danica said it earlier, just because you're not having the conversation with them does not mean the conversation is not being had. And if you don't participate in what your children will, is learning, what they're learning, someone else is teaching them. And it may be something that you disagree with. Um, and, and so it is important for you to check in with your children about race, about racism, uh, and how they are experiencing that and having those conversations in this world. And so I leave with those three tips. Uh, again, it's to, um, uh, speak double, I'm sorry, spend double the amount of time listening versus speaking. Uh, personalize the conversations when you can use scenarios. Uh, and last but not least, I am encouraging all to 
not talk about race as if it is a dirty secret. Bring it to the forefront. Yes, appropriately have the conversation, but don't avoid it. Put it on the table and have that conversation with your, your family. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. So much about empathy, right? And helping our children sort of step into the shoes of other people. Um, and I appreciate that, um, you know, that, that notion that race isn't a, a, a dirty secret. And um, I think those of us that grew up in, you know, traditional, speaking for myself, in a traditional New England house, it was something that we, you know, we, we did not talk openly about. So um, I think that that may be the case for a number of my my colleagues and peers as well. So we have a number of questions that some have come, a couple, only a few came in through um, the questions in advance, and I have not looked at the Q&A yet to see how many questions are in there, but there's a few um, from the Q&A online for the preschool through grade five that um, I, I wanted to sort of talk about. One of them talks about, um, in particular, uh, discussing racial injustice and white oppression with a white six-year-old child. Um, the parent explains that, you know, that as a white mom, they have to uh, acknowledge their own privilege and complicity in racial oppression, but I'm not sure how to talk about them. I think you've both given some really nice tips about that as well as Dr. Toulousen. Um, and then there's a line in here that I wanted to talk about a little bit. It says, it's a fine line between responsibility and guilt, um, and I'm not sure how to approach this. So what thoughts do you two have about that? Or either one of you, I don't, either one of you can take it. There's a fine line between responsibility and guilt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's truthful for me to say that guilt is a part of the, the experience. It's going to come. There's no avoiding it. In fact, you should expect it. Um, what I wanna say as a black man is if you're feeling some guilt, it, it gives me a spark of hope. It means, right, you're being affected by it. It's when you can see these things or, or avoid the conversations or ignore race and or racism in this country, uh, that's when I start to worry. So if you're feeling some guilt, that means you actually may be feeling something that might propel you to work. Um, uh, so we, we, we're talking about the fine line between, what is it, responsibility is the word? Yes, uh, that being said, when you feel that guilt, uh, if it is propelling you to responsibility, I encourage you to react to that gut feeling uh, because you have to be a foot soldier in this war, right? We, we need you to be a part of the conversation. We need you to have conversations with your children and we need you to be a part of the action steps that come with that guilt, right? Normally when I, I say something to my children and, and I can see in their faces that I have hurt their feelings, I get this feeling of guilt, which propels me to go and talk to them and say, my son, my daughter, I am sorry. Please tell me what I've done, right? And so that helps me to dissolve that or to resolve that problem. And, th and there isn't much different in, in what you're feeling with, you know, what you're witnessing in the news and the conversations that you might be having at work or with, or with your, your family members at home. That feeling is real for you. Um, and it's probably, it's your gut speaking to you saying, now is the time to do something. So now, that being said, I am going to say, be strategic and be smart about what your responsibilities are. There's some things you might be ready to do today, and there's some other things you need to get, get a little more knowledge and understanding before you go running out into the street and, and you know, and, and doing something reckless or, or thoughtless. So don't be ashamed of that guilt. I promise you, it's com it comes with the territory. Uh, embrace it and, and learn how to turn it into actionable uh, steps for you to move forward. Thank you. Um the, the other, there's another one that says, my children are five and seven. They've been listening to the stories about racial discrimination, but I find they're not able to believe the stories as true and things that actually happened in real life. They're under the impression those stories are fictional and they make them sad. So Danica, how might you make children believe the stories that they hear are in fact true? I would say that one of the things that's important for us to remember is that each child is going to absorb this information at a different rate, right? So children oftentimes need to hear things repetitively in order to understand um, the impact of some of these stories. One thing I would ask is, you know, what do the, um, who, who goes to the playgrounds that you go to, right? Who do you have in your life? Who are these children seeing? So that you can, like Ed said, right? 
insert people that these kids actually know into these stories. So if you're finding that kids are not thinking about these stories as being real, one, they might just have to get a little older and keep hearing these stories, right? Don't stop telling them. And the other thing is that it might be harder for them to connect these stories to people in real life because maybe they don't know people who are represented in real life who exist in the stories that you actually know or they're not seeing enough people who look different from them so that they're able to realize that um, people of color are actually experiencing these things. But I would definitely say, um, do not give up. Another thing that I would say, and I'm gonna tie it into something I'm seeing in the chat. Someone said, I'm tired of talking, no action. Another way for kids to um, realize that these stories, these struggles are real is to get your kids involved in some action. So it's really important that we help young people figure out what levers they can pull to actually make a difference. So that might look like writing to a toy company because the toy company does not represent kids of color in their toys. Or same thing might go for a book company. It might be writing a letter to Congress, right? Teach young people that the people who make laws or help pass laws um, make decisions about who gets what, who has access to what. And if we're seeing something unfair in our society connected to a story, maybe a kid thinks isn't real, then we can sit down and write a letter. What do we wanna see for this group of people so that we can participate in the work to creating more justice? Thank you. There's one more question that came in ahead of time um, and it's got a couple parts to it. So, um, the question was due to a stressful atmosphere in the world and children already needing to learn about COVID, at what point is Tough Topics a parent's decision to talk to their children about instead of their teachers? Um, and this parent shares that there was an article about the death of George Floyd that um, their son's, uh, nine-year-old son's teacher shared last week. Um, the child didn't have any, inf any information about it prior to uh, getting on this Zoom meeting with their class. Um, and the child suffers from anxiety and depression and is still processing a lot of fears around COVID. Um, so the parent expresses a lot of frustration that this happened um, without discussing it with parents first. Um, and so I can, I can address that one. Um, part of our work as a district is to have ongoing conversations with children about difficult conversations. We definitely want, our, want parents as partners. This, this webinar and um, some of our communications and resources we've sent out in the past um, and a lot of our work, um, especially moving forward, will be around making parents partners in the conversation. But we really do believe very strongly that part of our work is to teach kids about history and about things that are happening around us um, and to help kids make sense of them. I will caveat that though with the notion that it is critically important for our teachers to also know their students. Um, and I think you've heard both of our presenters tonight share that you know there are age and grade appropriate types of things for different students. And that really is important when we think about talking about difficult conversations. Where is each one of our children going to be entering the conversation? What do I need to maybe think about? Um, how might I have a conversation with families beforehand to make sure that the, you know, the child is in a place to hear and understand those things? So there are some things that you know we can do to help make that experience better and I also think that you know if parents really have concerns about the things that are being covered in their classroom we always always encourage them to talk to the teacher and share that that frustration and that experience with them so that we can continue to grow as well the last part of that question um, speaks that um, all lives matter and should be all the notion that all lives matter should be introduced and this should be taught from birth. Um, and so I was wondering if Ed or Danica had any thoughts about that particular piece of the of the question. Uh, sure, I agree with you. All lives do matter. Uh, and, and it's only right that I it's, it's an assumption being made, which I don't usually do, but I, I think the statement must be piggybacking on this, this the movement that Black Lives Matter, and, and that's a lot of the conversation that's happening on the news, um, in the media, so on and so forth. Um, I want you to also know that the, the founders and the participants in Black Lives Matter also believe that all lives matter. Um, there is There has never been a conversation that um, insinuated all lives did not matter. However, it is important um, to put Black Lives, the Black Lives Matter movement logo 
uh, slogan at the forefront because there is a, a dire need for the rest of the world to understand that all lives can't matter until we can equally recognize that black people's lives matter as well. And so we're looking for folks to stand behind that, right? Uh, and, and I'm going to say we because I'm not sugarcoating this. I am a black man and my life does matter, but so does my neighbor, Kevin, and he is a white man. Uh, but in order for Kevin's life to matter, there may be days when I have to step in and support Kevin, vice versa. There will be days when Kevin has to step in and support me. And I'm going to connect this directly to um, the question about, um, you know, teachers covering a uh, certain curriculum, uh, even though your children had not been exposed to it before. Please keep in mind that your child is not the only child in the classroom. Your child might be witnessing other students in their classroom suffering crying, having conversations about it. And so it is important for your child to be able to engage in that and or support his or her peers uh, in that moment. If we're keeping them out of the conversation, then they can't really be a, a, a support, right? This goes back to the guilt versus responsibility. Um, so I think it's actually unfair uh, to not allow a student to participate in the conversation, if it is appropriate, of course. I, I do not, I am, a, I am a father. I think every parent has the right to know what their kids are learning about. Trust me, for years I've had to interject around uh, Thanksgiving when they start to plan. They always ask my daughter, the one pretty brown skin in the, in the classroom, to be something that she is not, right? So I, I, I certainly understand that. Um, and I find that that's my responsibility as a parent to have a conversation, have a conversation with her about why I don't want her playing this role in this particular play. Or she needs to understand why are your peers crying about what's happening in the news? What is it that's happening in the world that you may need to know about? And so while I respect parents wanting to know what's being said in the class, I, I do think uh, it is important to, and have, to have those conversations with the parents, but also see both sides of the spectrum because our children are not the only children in that space. Thank you. We have two questions in there, and I know we got started a little bit late tonight and had some technical difficulties. So hopefully, Danica and Ed, you'll you'll bear with me. We'll answer these two questions, and then any others that come in, um, we'll we'll work on sort of a Q and A. Um, the um, one of the uh, panel or the excuse me the the attendee says, how do we teach our children to respond to active racism from others in front of them in the moment? I think some of that depends on the age of your child. I think when it's younger children, one of the phrases that you can give them, right? Uh, on the playground, we hear kids say stuff like, you're black, you can't play with us, right? So one of the things that you can teach your kid, you draw a very strict line. It's not okay to exclude anyone because of who they are, right? So that's one of the ways. Um, another thing for kids who are older, right, the social consequences become a little greater when you speak up in front of your peers. Um, younger people tend to just sort of be a little freer with how they respond in the moment. But I mean, it's one very useful tool as young people are developing this language is to teach them to say that's not okay. Right? That's offensive. That's not okay. Don't say that. So I hope that you understand, especially, um, Ed, I want to model this for people real quick, but even just in hearing you talk, I've learned so much from you, right? So even though we're in this work, we, we are still learning ourselves. And I will say for myself, it wasn't really until I got to college that I um, felt like I had the perfect perfect language to be able to interrupt racism in real time, right? It takes a lot of practice. Some of it means actually preparing statements in advance or after an interaction, you go back and you think about what you said and what you could say differently next time because we know that these things come up again and again. So making sure that kids know that even if they don't have all the words, that to interrupt something that they know is wrong, even if they say, I don't know exactly how to articulate why that was wrong, but I know it was wrong and I wanna come back and talk to you tomorrow. Even statements like that, draw a strict line that language that reinforces the system of racism is not acceptable. Ed, do you wanna add anything to that? Yes, and one, one tip you can give to your child and, and one that we need to use ourselves as adults um, oftentimes you'll see young people confused about what they should do, when they should do it, and how they should do it because the scenario didn't involve them. Um, it doesn't have to, right? 
teaching our young people to be able to use I statements and say, I know this had nothing to do with me, but let me tell you how it made me feel when I heard you call that person the N word. Or let me tell you how it made me feel when I saw you spit on that girl. Right, so they can interject by saying your actions, they're affecting me. Therefore, I have the right to say something. Because the first thing most people say is, mind your business, this has nothing to do with you. But it does if it's affecting me. And so young people do have that right to say what you've just done or what you just said or what I've just witnessed is affecting me in this way and I do not like it. So it, it certainly helps. Those are great points. Um, and I, I just want to, again, in closing, um, because we are out of time, I want to thank our panelists tonight, Liza, Danica, and Ed. I know I walked away with a couple new tips and tricks, more than a couple. Um, and I want to just share with families that we will be sending out some additional links. Danica and Ed have helped to um, pull some more together for us um, and are going to share. And in closing, I just want to say that as you all are aware, our children are constantly receiving messages about race from all around them. They learn from the things that we say um, and, and what, we, what we do, and they also learn from what we don't say and what we don't do. They notice patterns around race, all sorts of them. What race are the kids that are featured in the books that I see and read in my curriculum at school? Which, which children do teachers see more likely to scold? Which groups do what work in our world, in the world around us? It is our responsibility absolutely to take action and reflect on our own racial identity and how it makes us navigate the world as individually, both individually and collectively as a school community. It's time we purposely shift our language from celebrating diversity and inclusion to emphasizing our commitment to anti-racism, equity, and social justice. This work is a marathon, not a sprint, and we hope that you will join us to engage your children in regular ongoing conversations about race. Thank you again to Danica and to Ed and to Liza, and thank you for all of you who joined us and spent time with us tonight. Take care of yourselves and your loved ones and enjoy the summer. Good night. <laughs>